Hello. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Downtown Music Gallery's weekly music series. We're doing a uh, celebration for one of my best friends, Steve Dalashinsky, passed away last month. Um, I met Steve around 1985 at the original Knitting Factory on uh, Houston. Um, knitting fa when the Knitting Factory opened, it was like the first place that many, many downtown musicians, jazz, rock, came together and started playing weekly. Um, and it became like a place where everyone would meet, go to lots of gigs. I made a lot of my friends there. Um, there were a lot of concerts I went to when the only people at some of these shows were two couples and me. Uh, one of the couples was uh, Irving and Stephanie Stone, um, who I met uh, at a John Zorn concert around 79. Um, they were beautiful people. They were, they, I didn't know much about him when I met him, and when I first met him, I went up to them at, at a John Zorn concert where he was playing mouthpieces and duck calls, and um, Eugene Chavon was playing balloons. And, and I said to them, because they looked like they were my parents' age, which looks old, and uh, <laughs> I said, do you like this stuff? And they said, oh, yes, we love this stuff. We think this guy, Zorn, is, is like the, nec the next great thing. And I was like amazed that, th that they really liked these guys. They said they saw him open for uh, David Murray, and I thought what he was doing and Chad Bourne was doing was much more interesting. So we, we bonded at that point. And then a few years later when the Knitting Factory opened, there's another couple there, Hugo, who's with us here tonight, and Steve, and both of them also were part of that scene. And we went to gigs at that place three nights a week, four nights a week, all week long. There's so much good music happening there that we, we kept going back. I mean, a lot of people, they go to like a religious place to get replenished for stuff, but this was kind of our place, like a, like a church or a synagogue where we would go and be inspired. And um, there was a period of time when uh, this guy named Charles Gale showed up. And he played every week. He was a free jazz sax player who was living on the street. He was homeless at the time. He played every week for maybe a year or two. Every Monday he would play. We would be there every week. He would play, and it would be like seeing Coltrane in his prime because we would be overwhelmed with the type of music that he did. Um, and we and this just brought us together. I also met some other friends of mine some of whom I'm still friendly with, some of whom have moved long out of New York. But this became like a very close community of people, not just the musicians, but the people in the audience who were there taking up this music. Um, this first set, we're gonna do three little sets. The first set, I'm gonna read one of Steve's poems, then we'll do a duo with, with me and uh, Frank Meadows playing bass. Frank works with me now, which is a good thing for me. Um, then, and then, <laughs> Then there's going to be a quartet uh, playing, uh, and the quartet's going to be Marty Arlick on alto sax, uh, Frank Mason in, that's it, I don't know, Michael Vatcher on drums, Thomas Chess on oud, and Jason Wang on violin. That's a pretty stellar lineup. They're going to play and bring us out to someplace beautiful where we're going to end up. So here's uh, one of Steve's poems. I've been, in my apartment, I've been actually looking through boxes of uh, books and CDs and finding things that I didn't even know I had. So I found a couple of Steve's uh, books, uh, including this one, which was written for Cecil Taylor. It's called Mantis, came out in the late 90s. It's an incredible book. I've been reading it all week long. There's just so many great poems in here. Um, I didn't know Steve even wrote it at the beginning, but when I saw him at the Charles Gale gigs, I saw him like writing away stuff. Um, and I went up to him once, I said, what are you writing? He goes, oh, I'm this music inspires me to write poetry. And he started doing poetry readings at a place called the Knot Room, which is on the bottom of the Knitting Factory. And he asked me to read once with him at, at the Knot Room, and I was honored, because I was in awe of how, how good his poetry was. Because he was able to articulate what was special about that music. Okay. This is called The Psychic Washing Machine. The Momentum of the Ticket. As the station closes, in and the vehicle slows. A live soft process, hard look of wood on polished wood, union upon reflection on dark glass. Therefore, it is a motion picture as one thing moves within the other. And again, the question of the other. 
of balance, of light, and language. I am naive servant to both. A, a bar of broken minerals, chain of silk flesh secretions. A water, a singing branded body of meat, a sack of ribs. Vegetable skin of transient ideals. Woman fanning herself. Gentleman stretching his limbs. Only animal that drinks beer by choice. The momentum of the reflection in the wood. This way, that. Live brown enters the black. Motion. Picture, screen. Into relevance, tolerance. Simply stated or not. There were three different twos spoken here. Written at the cooler, August 8th, 1997. This is called Glissandos, dedicated to the music of Cecil Taylor. Bobs his head up and down, sadly happy. That was about as gentle as Mayakovsky when he put his gun to his head, sadly happy. A caution light. He flung himself around like poetry. How gentle is gentle. Subtle, restrained, one dimensional. A workhorse. Plowing himself into a hole. Like the threads of Mayakovsky's shirt. Like his gills, like Mayakovsky's head, supported by music, smashed and bobbing. Her head bobbing to the music, like Mayakovsky and disappointment, like culture, like revolutions. Forlorn lovers, smashed skull, like Mayakovsky. Set to at the Village Vanguard, June 26th, 1994.
Thatcher, come out. Uh, Jason, Tom, Marty. Um, by the way, there's um, wine and um, water, uh, fruit, vegetables, and some other catered uh, goodies if anybody wants it. This is the first Cosmic Quartet. Thank you. 
Yeah. Marty Ehrlich. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Chess on oud. Michael Batcher on drums. Jason Cowan on violin. That's uh, the end of part one. There'll be part two and part three coming up. Stick around. Um, have some wine or some water or some vegetables and some food. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to tell you a, a true story. This uh, took place in um, early 90s at the old knitting factory. There used to be a band, um, late 80s, early 90s, called Prima Materia. And this band uh, included uh, Louis on tenor, uh, Alan Chase on alto sax, Joe Galan and William Parker on bass, and Rashid Ali on trumps. Uh, this was an amazing band. Now, Rashid Ali, as you probably know, uh, was the last drummer that played with John Coltrane. That's some pretty heavy baggage to wear. Um, he was an amazing drummer. He was also a friend. I hung out with him a couple times. He was beautiful. He was deep. Um, in the 70s, he had his own band together. And uh, that band would play. Uh, he had a club called Alley's Alley, which I went to a bunch of times. Um, and they would... Uh, they wanted to tour Europe with this band, and the promoters would say to him, uh, we want you to do a Coltrane tribute with your band. And Rashi would say, no, I wrote music, I'm gonna do my own music. Sometimes he would get the gig, sometimes he wouldn't get the gig. Um, in the 80s, him and Louie got together and started rehearsing and playing. They became friends, and Rashi said something to Louis like, you know, you play this music the right way, um, and I'm happy to play with you. They worked together. They put this band together. This band played only the music of John Coltrane and Albert Eiler. Their gigs were special. Their CDs were special. And I remember a gig in particular. I believe it was early 90s. Um, they played two sets. And at the end of the first set, Louis said, uh, I'm going to invite a friend of mine to come on stage and sit in with us. And that friend was John Zorn, who was playing alto sax. Um, and uh, him and Louis were old friends, and he inspired Louis to pick up sax later on after he picked it up. And uh, the band is playing this, I believe it was a Coltrane song, um, and Zorn is taking this solo. And he starts at the, at the bottom, playing intensely at the bottom, and he builds it higher and higher and higher. And Steve Stalachinsky was sitting next to me at a table, and we're like watching this go on. And uh, I see Louis on the side of the stage, and Louis is like smiling. He has this really beautiful smile. And I look, and there's Rashid back there, and Rashid is watching Zorn as he takes the solo, and he also has this smile like, holy shit, this is the, this is the, the thing. So I look over at Steve, and uh, we both start smiling at each other because we realize that this is like one of the greatest solos of all time. And we're there, and we're, we're, we're part of it, and it's going higher and higher and higher, and it reaches this crescendo and uh, just completely blows our mind. And uh, at the end of the song, I got up, and me and Steve hug each other, and we look at each other and we say, you know, that was one of the greatest solos of all time, and we're really lucky to be here. And I think the last thing we said was, you know, we could die right now, but realize we saw one of the great sax solos of all time. Um, that's the way I remember Steve. He was always at gigs. We reached, we wanted to see that, that transcendence. We wanted to reach that, that high. That's why he went from gig to gig to gig all the time. You'd see him in the, in the back going out to another gig, because he, and he didn't want to miss something. He wanted to be there when that, when that magic moment hit. So... Rashid has passed, but Louis is still with us. He's going to play solo right now. Uh, he's going to play a Coltrane piece for us. Then he's going to go into a quartet piece with Marty Ehrlich, Jason, um, Tom, maybe someone else. We'll see. But we're going to reach for this now. And uh, this is Louis Bellagenis right here. Well, you know, I actually remember that night, Bruce. Uh, and I remember that so long. <laughs> Play it now. It's still, it's still etched in my brain. Nobody will ever forget. Yeah, that, that, that was a remarkable night. And since you brought up Rashid's club, 
I can remember a night that I was there, uh, where Steve was also there, um, and we were there to watch um, Threadgill's band. What was the trio called? Air. Air. We, we were there to watch Air. And um, thank, thank you, Kurt. <laughs> and um, I wasn't planning on saying this. So I, um, and Roscoe Mitchell was the guest. And Roscoe did a similar kind of thing. And I remember, I was, this, is, this goes back to what Bruce was. I was with John, John Zorn, that night uh, checking it out. And um, Roscoe, I, I mean, I, I don't know how I could put it into words, <laughs> except to say that I was, I'm very good friends with John, and he's an obsessive practicer. And I remember after that night, we got together the next day and he told me he couldn't practice that day mm -hmm. because he had so much of Roscoe's music oh, in his okay. head mm -hmm. that he, you know, it was almost like he was saying, I don't know if I can follow that, <laughs> even in the practice room, you know. So I think mm -hmm. when you hear what Bruce was saying about music that's transcendent, it, it's not just that, I mean, it really blows our minds and it opens our hearts. And, you know, that's what, we live, we live for. And that's not just with music, that's with people too. We have to remember that. Um, and so a gathering like this is really incredible to see all these people come out for a very beloved member, not only of our community, but of the world, let's say it, of the world. So um, it's a tribute to Steve. Steve and I talked a real lot, especially in the mid 90s. Uh, I was always at Rashid's house, 77 Green Street, and Steve was um, on prints, selling his wares, just hanging out, doing whatever Steve did. And uh, I'd always walk by him on my way, and uh, we'd have a great conversation. And a lot of times we talked about Coltrane and this project that Rashid and I had put together well, called Prima Materia. And we talked about the rap that we were going to do. And one of the things that we talked about was uh, the meditation suite that Coltrane had done. And recently I've begun playing the Meditation Suite as a solo concert, and I thought it would be appropriate. It's, it's too long to play the complete show, the complete music, but I'm going to play the opening movement, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost of John Coltrane's Meditations. I'm gonna play it like a prayer, and uh, it's for Steve, obviously.
Consequences, which reminds us of our karma. And the last piece in the suite is Serenity. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with the third part. The third part is going to start with three poems, poets, um, two that are going to read poems inspired by Steve that were written since his passing, and then Yuko Otomo is going to pl uh, read some poems of her own and Steve's as well. I'm going to go into the third part, but the next, the part, then I'll come back and explain because it's kind of complicated. Uh, so first is going to be Louisa, so you can come up and read, and then Matt Cohn, and then uh, Yuko. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you, Bruce. I feel so incredibly honored to be here, and thank you all so much for the sounds and the music and the words. Um, and thank you, Yuko. Um, I, Steve was one of the people I would bump into at least once a week um, over years, as many of us, I feel. And he would just always show up, and he would just always talk to you, and he would just always like so many said before, be very generous and really listen. Um, and he'd love to talk, but he would always, always also really listen. Um, and it's, listening is a beautiful thing. Um, I, when Steve passed, I, somehow this poem popped out of me, I think right the day after or the night. I was on the phone with Shelley all night because Shelly didn't know about it, Shelly Hirsch didn't know about it, and anyway, I'm good friends with her, and we were on the phone, and then, um, and kind of went through things, and then uh, the next day, uh, this came out, and I would like to share it, and thank you, Bruce, for having me. Um, it's quite serendipitous, my best friend, who is my artistic partner, uh, it's his birthday today, and he took his life two years ago, sure. and um, he was uh, Monroe Leaf's grandson, um, for, who wrote Ferdinand the Bull, and he was also an amazing writer and genius, and he would have loved Steve so much, and I'm very sad they never got to meet, but James, um, James and Steve, like, everybody's here, and that's really great, um, so, yeah, without further ado, and you guys feel, feel free to, whatever you want to do, um, I would love sound. A storm knocked down this tree the other day. It was of your stature, well, slightly wider, slightly more upright, but just the right size. You know, when you look at a tree and think, oh, you're just the right size, that way. A storm knocked down this tree the other day. And then there was a lot of silence. The same happened to you right after dinner. Just when you thought you were doing fine, and you were. You, the cyclone, just fine. A storm knocked down the street the other day. The storm might not have planned to do so, might not have wanted to, but did it anyway. With the tree in its orbit, eyeing it just enough in its way to knock it down 
ended. A storm knocked down this tree the other day. And where one is unrooted, another one goes back to their roots. Back to the ground, where one belongs, or at least thought one did. And instead, flies. And instead is the cyclone's eye, for what it's worth. And now, a storm knocked down this tree. Transitioning, they say. A storm knocked down this tree, strongly built, more on the inside than out. A storm knocked down this tree, and we're still waiting. A storm knocked down this tree. Hard to tell one apart from the other. A storm knocked down this tree. Only after. Only after one can. This is called In the Moment for Steve. In the jazz, I feel the freedom. I feel Steve Delachinsky's freedom. I feel the openness and the love. I feel New York. And even when I'm broken, we're all broke, I can sit down for 10 bucks and listen to the greatest players on earth. I can listen to improvisation and feel the freedom. I don't know what you think. I don't even know what I think. It just comes. It comes and comes and comes again, like some virile aptitude coursing through free-thinking fellows and ladies listening feeling the bass, the xylophone, the drum, feeling the sax players wailing. This is a night for Steve, but I'm not just thinking of him, I'm thinking, trying to think with him, trying to imagine why I always thought he was my brother, father, friend, but didn't know, had no idea, hundreds, yes, hundreds of us love this man, his intimacy and immediacy, his moments with us, everywhere and anywhere, from the streets to the shows to our years, over many years and ears and eyes as we boogied down with how he felt about the beats and how he loved the life he loved. For Steve stands for no one but everyone enjoying and getting out and seeing. And look, look, the last time I saw Steve, it was supposedly what was going on that night, a big show, the last show of This Is Not This Heat. And I saw Steve and I asked, how's it going? How are you? And he immediately started to talk about the poetry scene, scene and it was a complaint. And I think he was gonna tell me stuff about people I don't know or haven't met yet, and I grabbed him by the shoulders, or at least that's how I remembered it, I interrupted. I could tell the music could get loud any second now, and I said, no, Steve, hi, how are you? I mean you, you, not the poet, how are you feeling? I have been saying this a lot lately to everyone because my dad died a year ago, and his was in the middle of a lot of other deaths. A lot of people died this year. So everyone who is alive, I say, how are you, the you, the you who is you? And Steve nodded and he looked at the ceiling for a brief second and he said, fine, I'm fine. This moment now, a few days after you have gone, in my mind, you're still going to show after show and I want you to be writing this for me. Even though I am on my phone and I don't think you ever did that, it's beatness to me, my typewriter and it's legible. I'm a cipher for you who I cannot be, you who I always thought I, I might be. 
What I admire most about you, Steve, young man, is that you mostly got younger, better, lyrically, and clearly becoming the long distance runner, becoming a better performer as you pulsed with Yuko and made proof, never ending proof that you weren't just a fan, but a listener, a jazzer, in your heart and in your glint. 20 years from now, will I remember how I found this parking spot? 20 years from now, will I remember the taste of this beer? 20 years from now, how will I accurately remember I saw this jazz combo? Will it be nothing? Will I not remember the vibes? How is all this filtered? Why does some of it never go away? With Steve, a lot remains. As, as long as I've known Steve, his wife, Yugo, was part of the experience of, of knowing Steve. She's yeah. always been next to him. She's an artist in her own right. She's a poet right. and a visual artist. Uh, she's one of my oldest friends, and she's going to read for us now. Yeah, sure. Excuse me. Like Bruce said, Stones, Stephanie Stone, Alvin Stone, Bruce, me and Steve are like a little family who followed around every great music. Rain, shine, or snow, or sleet, storm, anything. We never stop following around. And sometimes we're just five people, sometimes 10 people. But it was an incredible journey from the mid 80s on, it's like we never stopped. We almost lived in knitting factory and tonic. We never really, never missed anything. Especially Steve was a maniac, as you know. <laughs> he never missed anything. And that went on and on and on until the day he collapsed. He didn't miss a ride either. Across huh? He never missed a ride across town. Yes. Uh, oh, so anyway, I'm, this book actually, Kurt read beautifully. Just for Charles Scare, one musician, he followed him, we, we followed him around for over 20 years, and he wrote on little scrap paper every time he listened. And this is a collection. And he was shy, but this book got Pen Award, you know? <laughs> but anyway, so I'm reading from this book, and I don't know if you remember, any of you remember this place called Ray Ta Taylor's Ribbing Room, you remember? It's, he was a squatter who had a place that he called it Living Room. It's in the Lower East Side, and it's just disappeared. And every venue in this book is all basically gone. But Steve wrote like a date, where, and who played. So I'm reading from this Ray Taylor's Living Room section from this Final Night for Charles Gale Notebook. July 12th, 1989. Charles Gale, William Parker duo at Ray Taylor's living room, poem one. I stand outside on the edge of my shadow, at the edge of the doorway, and the night is crying, small tears for me. There is a pause in God's assemblies, and the lives of the soldiers of our lives pass slowly beneath the clouds and above my arms. There is only the stone, the men, the women, and the small mother, cat. There is dark and light cloud and red heart, open and bleeding, all closed, frightened, and tyrannical. Above me is the life, lives of the soldiers of our lives, past imperceptible, ecstatically, ecstatically, almost unbearably slow, inside me, inside Ray Taylor's living room, beyond my shadow's head, the music that awakens them remembers. Oh, 
also this July 12, 19, 1989, so a few days later, uh, the same William Parker Charles Gale duo, they did a lot there. And this is the set two, poem two. In the music room, you've got your wish, a warm, embarrassed strength from the red corner, the privacy of the ruling class, fires dancing around the edges of your heart, and the musician and his shadow fornicating. In somber light in the music room, there is only a balance to conceal, all else is gatefold, openness, and exposed hard wills. In the mirror, a flower growing and its reflection here on the table in your hands. Summer comes and brings this enchantment. The moon glides quickly southward toward Brooklyn and smiling stops to peek through the maiden's wi window at Bridges End. A bride awaits me, carrying a mirror inside her heart. Okay. Another small one. This is 1991, August 24, Charles Gale Trio, Vatel Cherry, Bass, Dave Pleasant Drums, at Curiosity Workshop, Brooklyn, New York. Do you remember? No, <laughs> all those esoteric places. <laughs> Actually, I'm reading Anniversary 2. That's written for me and Steve. Anniversary 2. You and I, like two breeds, two movies, the same characters, different scripts, same set, and times different voices. You and I, in love for the first time, and maybe never at all. I am exhausted and out of ice. I bite every chance I get, yet you still tell me I am cute. <laughs> I mean, that's true. We've been together 40 years, like a little, little like an attached twins was kind of crazy, but he always made me laugh for some reason. <laughs> That's true, he was funny. Okay, so as you know, he was really a maniac. He's jumping around all the places. He's always like a, in a conflictual mode that he has to see three gigs at the same time. So <laughs> this is a poem I wrote long time ago. This is, uh, it's called, it's called Doppelganger. For Steve, I teased him in this poem. Doppelganger, for Steve, definitely and infinitely. I think I vaguely, vaguely know why I like to look for the moon alone or with you, walking at night in southern sky, north, east, or west. A moon whistles a shadow, perfect to stir a nostalgia in me for my apparition, apparitional double. You go back and forth and say, I wish I had another eye, self, so I can see the fireworks and listen to the Tibetan flutes at the same time. Mm. Steve, tonight, I won't tease you for your luxurious suffering, saying you're so greedy, since I share the, this delicious conflict with you. Firework at the pier and Tibetan flute at a small club downtown. I am sensitive and romantic enough to understand the pulse of this soul ringing dilemma. I wish I could be at two different places at the same time. On sharp silver tips, 
of the highest mountain on earth when the thin air makes us human, humble and kind. A flutist plays his flute, small or large, only to take, only to talk to the grand sky that we dramatically call heaven. On the pier of a small island crowded with a civilization, people gathered to dance under fireworks to celebrate an arrival of another summer. Washed by a sea breeze, everyone looks up at the sky to heave a joyous open sigh every time the darkness above is filled with transparent flowers so huge and ephemeral, awakening us with colors of light. Doppelganger, an apparitional double of your sweet self who likes to walk when the moon shines on a beach somewhere. I think I vaguely know an answer to the question you asked me on the way home, why we like to wear polka dots and stripes in summer. <laughs> And I, I'll end with a portrait I wrote for Steve called Nightscape. This actually, the image I had about him. Nightscape for Steve. In the distance, in the distant darkness, an ocean crashes against itself. It is silent. You stand and look at waves as if they were a fatal dream reality. Pity, charity, or love of any kind do not weigh heavy enough to make a balance with your impending sigh. I observe every detail of your despair and cannot do anything but fall together with you. Sentimentalist, outdated emotionalist, overrated romantist, pure stupidity, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Wherever we are, wherever we fall, we will at least be part of this humble and familiar nightscape. Thank you, Bruce, for organizing this. All your friends, thank you. The last part of this uh, celebration I'm going to play a song. Um, by the way, that was Yuko Otomo, by the way. <laughs> One of my best friends. <laughs> I'm going to play a song uh, by uh, John Zorn called uh, Kol Nidre. It's the Jewish prayer for the dead. It's a beautiful song. Uh, it's only five minutes, six minutes long. I want everyone to think about Steve while it's playing. Think about anybody. Sorry. Who you've lost in the last year or two. It's your time to reflect. Um, from that piece, we're going to go right into another kind of like meditative piece by all the musicians who, who are behind me. We're going to continue that for a while. Everyone will take a solo, something beautiful will happen. And at the very end, I'm going to come out and hold up my cell phone. I want everyone in the audience who has a cell phone to look for a YouTube image of Steve reading. Hold up your cell phone um, and the music is going to die down and this the voice of Steve is going to come through, and I want you to listen to his voice and to his words. 
Uh, he was an incredible poet. I know he said in, in interviews like the only thing he did good was uh, write poetry. That's not true. He was much more than that. He was he helped musicians out. He was a diplomat. He was great, and I miss. Oh. So listen and think.